Hello. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody up top. Yes, yeah, nice to see you all here tonight. Welcome to the 2018 University of Oregon Department of Physics Physics Slam. We're very excited. This is an event that happens once every three years. And obviously, you all are on the VIP list since you have tickets to this sold out show we have tonight. We're very, we're very happy to have you here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about what's going to happen. We have six contestants tonight that are going to be fighting for the crown and the champion of the physics slam. These six folks are professors in our own physics department here at the University of Florida, or, oh, excuse me, University of Oregon. <laughs> and I, I thought that would go over better than that. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so the, the, I am a proud duck, let me tell you right now. Um, so look, what we're going to do is we have talked these six folks into coming up here and I'm not protecting, but defending, in some sense, their particular facet of physics. And we have a, a, a quite varied group tonight, and they have 10 minutes, and I just told them we are actually going to hold them to 10 minutes to convince you and a very special group of people that's here tonight that their project and their facet of physics is the most exciting, and dare I even say the coolest facet of physics known to, here in Eugene. Would you say it's fair? That's a fair deal. Let's do that. So, so how we're going to do it, we have a list, and um, they're going to go, and we'll take a couple minutes in between where they need to get set up. But I want to say um, a couple things. We have two special groups of people here tonight. One is a middle school group from Cal Young Middle School, right here in, uh, right here in town. Thank you all for coming out. We're very stoked, to we're very stoked about that. And um, an extra special group of folks tonight, it turns out. Not only are these going to be folks that are in the audience, these are also the judges for the Physics Slam. It's a lot of responsibility we're putting on this particular group of folks, but I think they can handle it. This weekend, the Physics Department, the University of Oregon Physics Department, the Master's Industrial Internship Program, and the Women in Physics Program is hosting the Conferences for Women in Undergraduate Physics right here at University of Oregon. And 200 of those participants are in this room right now. Hold up your clickers and let's have a round of applause for, oh my gosh, look at all of them. The, it's, it's the entire middle section. And these are, these are um, young women that are from around norm, mostly the Pacific Northwest. We got folks from Idaho and California, Washington, Montana, and our own um, Oregon. Um, and then they're here for a, a conference and we've talked them into being the judges tonight. And how they're going to be the judges is real-time judging. Um, hold up your clickers again, ladies, just for a second to show folks. Uh, for, for the old folks like me in the room that don't know what these are, these are clickers that we have a little base set up, and the, and the, the, the judges are going to vote in real time. And um, Dr. Stephanie Majewski will do real-time data analysis for us, and, and, and she's going, she's going to um, do some calculating, and we will judge and, and calculate the winners right here for you tonight. So, and you see she has a pen in hand. It's, it's very prepared. So. <laughs> And so, so here's the scoop. I got just a, um, one more thing to say, and I would like to ask everybody, out of respect for our contestants, which we're going to laugh at for the next hour, let's all turn our phones off. Thank you very much. We encourage videos and, 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 um, and, and pictures and that sort of thing, but let's not beep, as a matter of fact, because let me tell you one time, I gave this big spiel, and then my phone went off in class. It's, by the way, that was extraordinarily embarrassing, too. Yeah. Okay, airplane mode is on. Thank you, folks. So, without further ado, what I would like to do is uh, maybe a little uh, introduce our very first contestant, Dr. Tim Cohen is coming up. Tim, come on up. Tim, Tim got his PhD at the University of Michigan in 2011 and came to UO in fall of 2015. So Tim is a, one of our newer faculty members. He's going to be defending theoretical fundamental particle physics tonight. We wanted to warm you up with something small and then we'll get to the hard stuff later. Um, the cool thing about Tim is he is also a, a killer drummer. Right? And so look, you know, a free jazz drummer, he does a lot of work there. And let me, it's a one sentence description of his talk. I'm going to try to convince you that contrary to your day-to-day -day experience of being solid, you are in fact mostly empty space. Good luck, Tim. Ten minutes. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you all for being here. It's really a blast to get the opportunity to do this. Um, it's nice to be up front because I'm going to 
hopefully not give you all an existential crisis, but instead try to connect some really cool ideas in physics to, um, to something that's very personal to you, namely your own bodies, okay? So um, I have this kind of provocative title here, and I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you're gonna get a real sense of what I mean by the phrase, you are only, uh, mostly empty space. So if you ask the question, what are we made of? Well, the, the first answer that might come to mind is that we're mostly made of water. So depending on your level of hydration, you're probably about 65% water. And, um, and so as a fundamental physicist, the question I'm always asking is, can I zoom in? Can I figure out if there are simpler building blocks? What are the fundamental rules? And so this is pretty, uh, you know, top level understanding of what we are as humans. And, um, and so I think we can go a little deeper. And in particular, we can zoom in on the water and we realize that water is built out of something more fundamental, namely the water molecules. And so here we have now the water is really built out of water molecules. So what's a water molecule? Can we take that apart even further? And of course we can, and that brings us down to elements, right? Water is H2O, it's made of hydrogen and oxygen. And, um, and in fact, we can revisit our question about what are we made of now in terms of the periodic table and in particular, by weight, you're actually mostly oxygen. I don't know if you knew that, but you are. Um, that's because of the water and the oxygen is heavy. But um, you're also a fair amount of carbon. We are carbon-based life forms after all. And, um, and a, a decent amount of hydrogen, again, because really we're just water bags. And, uh, and a few other things here. So, um, okay, that's fine. We're made of elements. There's a handful that are important. Um, but I think we can do better. I think we can go a little deeper. And so what, what can we do to reduce elements? Well, there's a really beautiful structure that underlies the periodic table. Namely, it's the properties of atoms and, and really the quantum mechanics that governs physics at the atomic scale and below. And so what's an atom? Well, an atom is really a, a charged central core, the nucleus, right? It's, um, well, we'll talk about what it's built out of in just a second, as you probably have guessed at this point. And then it's orbited by this cloud of electrons, okay? So we've got a big, heavy fundamental core in the center with positive charge, and then this cloud of neg negatively charged electrons bound by the electromagnetic interactions. And so what does it really mean for the electrons to be bound to the proton? Well, in the simplest uh, atom, namely hydrogen, which is one proton and an electron orbiting it, um, we can calculate on, with a pen and paper how this works, and we get pictures like this. Um, so these are known as electron clouds. It turns out when you get small enough, the rules really change dramatically, and quantum mechanics becomes important. And I'm not gonna, of course, have time to go into all these details. You could come take my course if you're interested, but, um, but in particular, I just wanted to flash this beautiful picture, and what it's showing you is, it's showing you not where the electron is, because if you ask my students, you, they will tell you I do not allow them to ask that question, and in fact, the rules of nature do not allow them to ask that question, okay? But instead, you can calculate what the probability is for finding the electron in any given place around the atom. So in each of these pictures, these are different energy levels of hydrogen, that's not so important, energy and angular momentum levels, but at the center is the proton, and then these are giving you a sense of where the electrons are most likely to be. One of the really cool things that I wanna point out here, and one of the spooky, weird things in quantum mechanics, is let's look at, for example, this one here. You might do an experiment and find that the electron is over here, and you look away, and then you do another measurement, and you find the electron is over here, and that's perfectly reasonable. There's a high probability for both, but you notice that there's black in the middle, and black means that it is not allowed to be at the center, and so that means that somehow the electron went from here to here. It's not anything like a baseball, right? A baseball would have to travel through the center. The electron can never exist in the center. So anyway, I just will leave you with that kind of weird, spooky thought and move on, but this is the way that atomic physics works. So. And if you were one of my students, Next week, actually, we're going to calculate the wave function of hydrogen, and it looks like this scary thing. And so um, you, can, you can corner some of them and ask them how excited they are to see this on the blackboard on Wednesday. <laughs> All right, so let's go further. We can take the atom apart, and we can reduce it further. We already talked about having a nucleus and an electron. So here's where the fundamental particle physics comes in. The electron itself is actually a fundamental particle, so we can't take it apart any further as far as we know. But the nucleus, the nucleus, as you probably know, it's built out of protons and neutrons. So we can take the nucleus, we zoom in, we see some protons are in there. 
you might think, okay, the proton is a fundamental particle. We've all heard of it, right? It's the, it's the building block of the nucleus. But that actually isn't true. It turns out that the proton itself is built out of even more fundamental constituents, and those are kind of on the same footing as the electron, okay? And you might have heard of quarks, um, and they're sort of the, the key players in the building blocks for the proton. So, um, there are these very cute plush toys for fundamental physics, if you're unfamiliar with them, but let's, let's take a look inside the proton and the neutron and see what we find. Um, so, we've got the proton, it has charge plus one, and the neutron is neutral, and it has charge zero, okay? So, we can do an experiment, we can unzip the back of them and see what's inside, <laughs> and what we find, we find a set of quarks and gluons in both the proton and in the neutron. And in particular, the proton is largely built out of these three quarks, um, two up quarks and a down quark, while the neutron is built out of two down quarks and an up quark. And one of the fun things that we can just do real quick is if I tell you the rules of the game, namely that the up quark carries an electric charge of two thirds and the down quark carries an electric charge of minus a third, I hope everyone in the audience can add up two up quarks and a down and see that the proton, in fact, would get a positive charge of one. And the neutron, which is built out of two downs and an up, gets no charge, okay? So this is, from a fundamental physics point of view, the way we understand um, what the proton and the neutron are and, and where they get their charges from. Um, okay, so it turns out to be even more complicated than that simple picture of the plush toys. In fact, inside the proton is a, a beautiful quantum zoo with um, interactions between the gluon, which carries the, um, the force that keeps this all together, and so here we have are up, two ups and a down inside the proton, but then there's this cloud around it. Um, and in particular, we know the proton weighs about one GeV in the units I like, um, while the, uh, the up quark and the down quark weigh two and five MeV respectively, and the gluon is massless. So it turns out that actually most of your mass is in your protons and neutrons, and, and the majority of that mass must come from somewhere besides the fundamental masses of these particles. It's actually in the kinetic energy of the gluons moving around inside the proton. Um, so when people tell you that the Higgs boson is responsible for all the mass in the universe, they're actually lying to you. It turns out that it's this effect, that it's, um, that it's actually the kinetic energy of the gluons. Okay, um, and I'm badly running out of time, so I'm just gonna flash this by and tell you that the standard model of particle, f oh, you showed me two minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, then I'll take my time. So, all of this gets organized into, um, into this beautiful picture that we know of as the standard model of particle physics. Um, I, I don't have time to go into it in detail. I'm just throwing some jargon at you um, to make me look smart, and so you'll vote for me. But, um, <laughs> but actually, uh, all of the players in the game that we've been talking about are up here. So, we've got the electron. We've also got the up quark and the down quark, making up our protons and neutrons, along with their friend the gluon. And then the photon is here. It turns out that the electromagnetic interaction, which is responsible for keeping the, uh, that nucleus bound to the electron through the electric charge, is, from a fundamental physics point of view, mediated by the photon, okay? So, for our day-to-day -day life, the standard model of particle physics reduces down to these couple of key constituents. And um, so, I just want to take an aside. I can't help myself. I'm a particle physicist by training and by love. And so, I just have to tell you, if you remember nothing else from my talk, and frankly, from any of the talks you're going to hear, you should remember that all of physics is particle physics, okay? So, I can hear groans out of my condensed matter colleagues, but they can just deal with it. This is the truth, okay? And so, um, so everything I'm telling you about the standard model, this is, oh, now I'm down to a minute. This is the story. All right, so, um, very quickly, I want to get to my point, which is um, I'm going to do some two quick estimates for you, okay? So, I want to know what's the distance between the proton and the electron. Um, I need to involve, I'm just going to do some dimensional analysis for the physicists in the room. So, I'm going to take Planck's constant, I'm going to take the speed of light and the electron mass. Um, those are all relevant for, uh, for looking at the atom, because quantum mechanics is important. There's photons being exchanged and the electrons around. And then I'm going to add in the fine structure constant. That measures the strength of electromagnetism, this famous 1 over 137. And you're going to put them all together in this form. And what you get to get, this gives you the right dimensions. And it also gives you the right behavior. As the fine structure constant goes to zero and the electromagnetic interactions turn off, then this radius better go to infinity because that means the electron wouldn't be bound. So that's why it shows up in the denominator here. You get a 10 to the minus 10. Let's talk about the size of the proton. 
I told you the mass of the proton was a GeV. We're going to use the same Planck's constant and speed of light. Those are still relevant. Quantum mechanics is super important for this beautiful dance that's happening inside the proton. And, um, and so we get the proton radius of 10 to the minus 15. So we can put this together, and my punchline is here, which is basically if you scale the size of the nucleus um, to a foot, the outermost electron would be about four miles away, whereas if you scaled the sun down to a foot, the outermost planet would be about a mile away, where that's not Pluto anymore, unfortunately, that's Neptune. But anyway, this gives you a sense of what I mean when I say you are mostly empty space. All right, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Well done. Very nicely done. So there you go, folks. There was our first contestant. As you can see, it's sort of a, a little wild and woolly up here, and, and there are some physicists in the room that have a little difficulty with the concept of time, evidently. But that'll be okay. We'll fix that next time. No, no, no problem. So hold on. We're going to get switched over to our second contestant. Our second contestant tonight is going to be Dr. Laura Jaunty. And Laura got her PhD at Harvard in, in 2013 and actually is a brand new doc and is going to arrive here at UO later this year in September of 2018. Um, Laura is going to um, defend experimental particle physics. And, and I, love, I love this particular thing. She once negotiated an early morning truce with a herd of wild buffalo, not related to particle physics directly, but sort of indirectly. And in a one sentence description of her talk, she will talk about how symmetry is important in physics and how we are all still searching to understand in what ways the fundamental laws of nature are symmetric. Laura, take it away. Hi, it's a, an honor to be here talking about one of my favorite topics in physics. Um, but before I start talking about physics, I'm first going to uh, learn how to use the laser pointer. Um, I'm going to take you through three images from the art world. So the first is an example of a rose window in many European cathedrals. The second is an example of a, a Buddhist wheel of life from a Tibetan monastery. And the last is much more recent. This is one of Escher's uh, many beautiful drawings. And so what do all three of these things have in common? Well, for one, they're beautiful. Uh, and the other thing that they have in common is that they derive some of that beauty from symmetry. And so what symmetry means here uh, I think, okay, what symmetry, uh, it's too far away. What symmetry means here is that we can rotate uh, or move, we can apply some transformation to these images and they stay the same. So we can rotate the first two or move left to right and up to down the last one and it looks the same. And artists throughout the ages have been using this idea of symmetry to make beautiful art and architecture. But humans, as curious people that we are, have also been wondering, is it only this love of symmetry? Is this only a human concept? Or is nature itself also symmetric in important ways? And as a fundamental physicist, to me, the most interesting way to look at this question is to ask how fundamental are laws of symmetry in the universe? And so what does symmetry mean in, in physics? So like rotating an image, um, which is some sort of transformation, what symmetry means in physics is that we write down the physical laws that describe some system, we apply a transformation to those, and if those laws are still valid in this transformed world, then that symmetry is one that is conserved by the system, that is respected by the system. Um, and so symmetry in physics, this story really entered the modern uh, physical world uh, in 1915. And that's when a mathematician named Emmy Noether proved a really remarkable theorem. And what she proved is that for every symmetry of your mathematical laws that you can write down, there is an a, a, a appropriate conserved quantity in the physical world. And so this is a relationship between the equations we write down and something we can go out to measure. And one of the classic examples of this is the symmetry of time. So if I perform an experiment at two o'clock, and I derive some laws of physics, and then I wait and I perform it again in two hours, and I find that the, I get the same laws of physics, that means that the, those laws of physics are symmetric in time. And that is equivalent by Noether's theorem to energy being conserved by that system. So we can go out and test whether or not energy is conserved, and we've done that, and as far as we know, it is conserved. And that means that nature itself is symmetric in time. 
And that's a really fundamental pillar upon what, which much of modern physics is built. Um, so another cool example of Noether's theorem is um, you can do the same experiment and very time, or very space, do experiments here and there, and if, if that's found to be valid, then this is equivalent to momentum being conserved. So symmetry is, is very important, um, and we see some beautiful examples of it being conserved exactly in the world. But let's step back into the art world for a second. Um, we also see that artists throughout the ages and cultures have used the idea of asymmetry to produce beautiful images. And here, the asymmetry is an expectation of symmetry um, that is somehow broken, and that gives us something that is uh, more interesting than something that's symmetric, and one might also subjectively say more beautiful. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you one image here, but you, I'm sure you know many more examples. Um, so as physicists, we like to wonder, is it just a human trait to find asymmetry interesting? Or does nature also love to mix things up? And so we go around and we find other symmetries we can test to see whether or not they're also conserved. And one of the simplest symmetries that we can test is what we call parity, which is really mirror symmetry, the symmetry between left and right. And so if this symmetry is conserved, then the physics, if you reflect it through a mirror, is still valid. And you can think of that as a clock, you reflected the mirror, um, it looks different, but 12 o'clock, you wait three hours, it's still three o'clock in the mirror reflected world. So if you step through that mirror, you don't know that you've been reflected. Time still moves in the same direction, the clock still looks correct to your mirror reflected self. So we know this works for clocks, and we can go out and test other fundamental things. Um, and so one thing we can test is how the different forces uh, behave in a mirror. And so electricity and magnetism, which Tim told you about, if you reflect that through a mirror, looks just like electricity and magnetism. Uh, Tim talked about the, the nucleus, and it's bound by, uh, by the strong force, which holds together the protons and neutrons. And when you reflect that through a mirror, that also looks the same. There's an additional force, which is the weak force, uh, which is what allows the sun to, to shine, to burn. And when this force was discovered, physicists everywhere assumed this must also conserve parity. A mirror-reflected sun must look exactly the same as the sun. Uh, it would be crazy to think otherwise. Um, but it turns out that it's, it's uh, not crazy. So in an experiment in 1956 that stunned the physics community, and I would say if you really think about it, it should still stun you today, um, a physicist named Madame Wu, who was a professor at Columbia at the time, performed an experiment with cobalt. And she, uh, so cobalt has an intrinsic spin, and she cooled down uh, the system and, uh, and applied a magnetic field so that all of the cobalt uh, atoms were spinning in the same direction. And what she found was that one of the decay products when this cobalt decayed is an electron. And all of the electrons were going in the same direction. And if you think about that, that means if you reverse the spin, they would go the other way. And so if you reflect that through a mirror, if parity were conserved, this is a good symmetry, then um, the, the, the spin would be going the other direction, but the, you would still get the particles going up because when you reflect through a mirror, you don't reverse up and down, you only reverse left and right. And that, of course, wouldn't happen because the particles have to be uh, that have to be ejected when you reverse the spin, they go the other way. And so this was an example of parity being violated. If you or Alice were to step through this looking glass, you would know that you were in a world in which left and right were reversed. You would be able to perform this experiment and tell the difference. And so it, it turns out, and this, this is really, we don't understand why, we don't know why, but it turns out that the weak interaction has a preference for left handed particles, particles that spin one particular way. And this is one example of how symmetry is actually perfectly broken in the natural world. So you might wonder, what about other symmetries? Okay, this is really interesting. Uh, what other symmetries are there? There are a bunch of other symmetry ones uh, out there, but um, what I think is uh, one of the best symmetries, one of the most awesome, um, it's so awesome that it, it uh, can be called nothing except supersymmetry. Um, <laughs> And so <laughs> supersymmetry uh, is a symmetry that if it's true, so on the top here you have all of the um, fundamental particles that Tim told you about, the electron, the photon, et cetera. If supersymmetry is a true symmetry, then for 
Each of those particles has a particular spin, um, which is an intrinsic angular momentum. If supersymmetry is true, then there must be an, an equivalent, another particle with a different spin that is exactly the same otherwise. Um, and so we're, we're looking for these to see if this is true. Uh, we haven't yet found them, so we know that the symmetry is not exactly conserved. If those particles exist, they must be heavier. Um, so one of the reasons supersymmetry is really cool, and super, in fact, is if it exists, then uh, it gives us a natural candidate for dark matter. So that's, that's a really cool thing. But there's many other ways in which it's super. So how are we continuing to look for these heavier super particles that may or may not exist? Um, so now we jump over to Switzerland, uh, to CERN, where we have uh, a fabulous uh, CERN director general, Fabiola, um, who is uh, leading this team of several thousand uh, physicists um, on the Large Hadron Collider, where we are colliding 100 million protons a second to try to produce, among other things, supersymmetric particles. And myself and several other colleagues here at Oregon uh, are very lucky to be using the ALICE experiment to look for these heavy supersymmetric particles. Uh, we haven't seen them yet, so this is still an outstanding question. Um, how symmetric is the universe? Uh, this, we're, we're trying to answer this, and we'll be taking data for uh, at least until 2035, so stay tuned. We, we, we may have an answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so actually, this helped me. Yeah, it's like a rip gun. So I'll tell you what. So, so, so look, I'll, I'll be done with this one and then give this to okay. whoever. That'll be the reason. Okay, Rudy, I'll give you this when I'm done. Right. Testing, testing, one, two. Is that okay? It seems a little bit not so loud. Testing, 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 testing. Yes, it's me here. Testing, testing. Ooh, okay. Actually, wait, we got a. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. Okay. There's a, there's a sound guy. Sound okay. Guy. We're good? All right. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. With small technical issues, as you may expect. Um, we have our third contestant that's coming up tonight, and as, as I see, we have props involved this time. So this is going to be very exciting. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's about to happen. Is <laughs> our, our third professor is is um, is is Benjamin Aleman. Ben has got his PhD from UC Berkeley and arrived at uh, University of Oregon in fall of 2013. So as it, Ben has been here for a couple of years. His general area of study is quantum and nanoscale physics and technology. And with the one sentence um, description of his talk is going to be: uh, We unveil a new way to detect light by hearing it. So, um, you know, get your ears ready to go. We're going to, uh, we're going to see something cool here in a minute. And one, I'm going to say one sentence by, um, by the way, the research that excites Ben is the interface between classical and quantum physics. So surprises are around every corner. And actually, it can be applied in ways that can help human beings. So what you're going to see here is a, um, an, a, a, an experiment that is coming together. It looks like, gentlemen, tiny little bit of light. A tiny little bit of light right there. Here you go. Ladies and gentlemen, Benjamin and the crew. Once upon a time, in a lab deep in the woods of Oregon. Hey, guys, guys, guys. So, you know how we can hear sound? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes air wiggle, and when air wiggles, it makes the drum, the ear drum, and your ear wiggle. And then eventually, little tiny hairs inside your ear wiggle too, and then they get to your brain, and voila, we hear. 
And we also have technology that can hear. For instance, a microphone takes audio and converts it to electrical signals. Right, right. And you know how we can also see light? Yeah, it's, it's like a... Oh. Uh, it's like an electricity wave, you know? But it doesn't shock you, but it can burn you. You know, if you go out in the sun, you, can get, you definitely get burned. It has lots of energy. So the energy actually goes into the eyeball, and uh, little electric circuits in the back of the eyeball called rods and cones get excited, and then voila, we see. And we also have technology that can see. For instance, all of us have uh, phones, probably, that have cameras that take definitely. light, that turns the light into electricity. Yep. Right, OK, so here's the idea. We can hear sound, yeah. and we can see light, okay. but are you ready for it? It's going to sound crazy. OK. Maybe we could hear light. What? what? Hear, hear light? light? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does that even mean? Like, what if we could send a light wave and have that like vibrate a eardrum or something, and then we could hear it? What, why would we want to do that? <laughs> Well, what if we could make like a, a better, it's a, a better, question. a better, we, we could see more colors. What if we could see UV light, IR, uh, well, x-rays? Sounds pretty good. Actually. What if, let's, this device, let's call it an ear ball. What ear if it ball. was better, faster, stronger? Uh, actually, I kind of like this idea. It seems, it seems kind of crazy. It is, it is. Do uh, you have any ideas on how you actually make this, uh, this ear ball thing? Yeah, so my idea is a bridge on a hot okay, summer day. What? what? Oh, come on, Andrew. What are you talking about? No, no, hear me out. Hear me out. OK, so the bridge in the summer, it's out, and it's hot, because it's hot. And then, then the bridge, it gets hot, and it expands, right? And okay, bridges even okay. have these things and in them called thermal expansion joints, so yeah, that when it expands, point. it doesn't that's like warp point. and break that's and stuff. Point. So yeah, that's cool. But anyways, let's say we take a drum, right, and we beat it. And then we shine light on it. And just like the bridge, the drum gets hot, it expands, and then the sound of the drum changes. Voila, we hear light. Hmm, that sounds kind of cool. Well, we're experimentalists, right? So here we go. We have a lab, and we have a nice Oh, we just drum. happen to have a drum and a heat yeah, gun. Yeah, let's, let's, let's actually check it out. And so we can, have a, we can listen to the pitch of this, of this drum, and we can heat it up. The idea is not crazy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, guys, 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 guys. Wait, but you're saying you can hear light? Yeah. So if I shine this laser on it, that should change the pitch, right? Well, let's check it out. Well, uh, it's not really working, Andrew. I'm not hearing much, sir, Andrew. I'm not sure this is going to work. We got a couple problems here. First of all, it's obviously not sensitive to light, obviously. It might be kind of slow, too, and it's, it's kind of big. Can't really fit in my pocket. I think this sounds like more like, uh, more like science fiction, huh? No, no, I think it will work. We just, uh, we need to make it really, 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 really ridiculously small. Uh, how small? Like, maybe like a bacteria size? <laughs> <laughs> bacteria? Are you serious? OK, look, if this were as small as bacteria, first of all, the skin of the drum, this thing here, would have to be so incredibly thin. Uh, the thing would actually just shatter in a million pieces if you played it. Uh, you need some kind of like super material or something, and I don't think that exists, man. I'm sorry, this is kind of a bad idea. What about graphene? Graphene? Graphene. You know the famous equation, scotch tape plus pencil equals Nobel Prize? Oh, yeah, graphene. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? It's a single layer of, of graphite. It's one atom thick, so you can't get anything thinner. That's pretty good. It's 200 times stronger than steel. Okay. It absorbs. All colors of light, even colors we can't see, That's what I'm and it heats about. up very quickly. Nothing, nothing heats up faster than, than graphene. All right, I'm in. Who's ready to make the world's smallest drum? Uh, Come on. I don't know. Don't leave me hanging. Come on. Do it. Right, We've got right, 10 I'm minutes. In. OK. <laughs> All right, go. So the physicists set out to make the world's <laughs> smallest drum. We built it. We built we a graphene drum head. We built a graphene drum head. Look. 
Am I dreaming? No, oh. it's right there. Oh my God. That's look. an image. You did it. You it's made, beautiful. You made the world's smallest drum. It's incredible. But, but how'd you do it? And, and uh, how big is this thing? Well, we borrowed techniques that microchip makers use. That's smart. And yeah. then we made really small glass bowls. They're about 100 times smaller than the thickness of your hair. Then we took the graphene, and just like saran wrap, we stretched it over the top, and boom, 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 graphene drum. Hey, OK. So we have the world's smallest drum right here. And like you said, we want to actually take light, shine it on the drum. It's going to get hot. When it gets hot, it's going to change the pitch of the drum. So the first thing we have to do actually is, well, naturally, Listen to the drum. Yeah, let's listen to it. Okay, let's do it. All right. The physicists set up their lab to hear the sound of the world's smallest drum. All right, drum. audio yeah, detection. Yeah, pitch detector on. All yep. right, let's okay. listen to the drum. All right, let's look at the data. Oh, what is it? Oh, look, 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 there's the data. Hey, nice. The drum has a sound. Hear the drum. <laughs> hear the drum. Nice job, we measured guys. the pitch. Yep. But, but now we need to make sure that the pitch changes when we shine light on it. That's true. That's the whole point, right? All right. So I'm going to take this laser, shine it on the drum, and slowly increase the power. All right. All right. Taking data. You got pitch detector pitch on. Pitch detector on. All right. Here we go. All right. Increasing power. OK, okay let's look at the, OK, let's check the data out now. OK, let's look. look oh, at look, look. The sound of the drum changes when we increase the laser power. We can hear light. We can hear light. I told you we can. You hear light. Light. Yeah, you look. You can change. You can increase the power of the laser, and, and the pitch. The pitch is going up. This is amazing, guys. It actually works. Yeah, told you. <laughs> um, but yeah, you did. We got to see how fast this thing can respond. So I think we That's should. True. We should pulse the light. Okay. Turn it on and off really fast. How fast should we do this? I mean, I think uh, something really, really, really fast, like 500 times a second. All right, let's try it. YOLO. <laughs> OK, pitch detector on. Pitch detector on. OK. Taking data. data. Let's see. Whoa. Oh, see, look. It oh, responds at 500 times a second. Wow, look at that. We can turn the laser beam on and off 500 times a second. Yeah. Look, the drone actually expands and contracts and actually cools and heats 500 times a second. <laughs> that is. 500 uh, hertz, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what that means, right? We can actually yeah. hear this yeah. thing. Yeah. So why don't we use the computer and we can make this into an audio Turn file? Turn the data into audio. Yeah, audio file. Okay, yeah. let's let's can listen you, to the you, data. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whoa! See? What? This it's five. Incredible. It sounds like a note. It does Great. sound like a note. So we can do it for one frequency. Yeah, we did. But what if we chirp it up? Chirp, chirp it, it up. up. You know, like if we start a low frequency and gradually increase, like. One way to find out. All right, I'll start turning okay. it slowly. Du, 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 du. Pitch detector on. Faster, faster, faster. Go. Taking data. All right, let's hear the chirp. Audio file. <laughs> See? Whoa, it works. It's so it great. Works. You know what that means, right? That's almost the whole audio spectrum. You know what we can do? Oh, yeah. Upon realizing that they can use the world's smallest drum, their earball, to hear the whole range of human hearing, they do what anyone else would do, encode their favorite songs into a laser beam, and rock the night away. There was no data hurt during that, although one physicist and four audience members in the top, I think, got laser in the eyes. But everything's okay. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.
they put them <laughs> I don't know. Hold on. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, while we get the mic switched over, I will, I will um, introduce our fourth contestant. Our fourth contestant is um, Dr. Ben Farr. Ben got his PhD in Northwestern University, and he um, actually is another brand new duck and is going to arrive here at UO in September, or oh no, or did arrive in September of 2017. His general area of study is something near and dear to our local hearts, uh, gravitational wave astronomy. In one sentence description of his talk, he's going to present how we have started listening to the soundtrack of the universe and what it's told us so far. Ben, take it away. All right. It's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me? Sound pretty loud? All right. Okay, so I'm going to tell you today about a, a little event called GW170817. Um, and it was astronomy's first talkie. Uh, so for those of you in the audience that are too young to remember, movies used to only be visual and there was no sound. Um, and, mu and much like that, uh, astronomy for centuries has really been dominated by the visible light. And we have now, for the first time, actually added a soundtrack to the universe and we're starting to do some pretty exciting science with it. Um, so here is a simulation of a binary black hole merger. So you can see the silhouette of these two black holes. Each one of them is about 30 times the mass of our sun, all packed into a very, very, very tiny volume, uh, relatively speaking. So this whole thing fits into the surface area of Iceland. So it's about 60 solar masses of stuff packed down into an area smaller than the size of Iceland. This video is incredibly slowed down. Um, all of this is happening in a fraction of a second. And what you're seeing is the last fraction of a second of the lifetime of two black holes that are gravitationally bound orbiting one another. And as they do that, they're emitting something called gravitational waves that is taking energy out of the orbit and causing it to shrink uh, to the point where these two black holes collide. And by the time that they get to merger, they're each traveling at about half of the speed of light. And they're losing so much energy in gravitational waves um, that they're actually losing about three solar masses in total of pure energy in the form of gravitational waves. Uh, so until 2015, we thought this must happen. We're pretty darn sure this kind of thing happens. Um, but as you can see in this animation, it's a little bit hard to see. No matter is involved in these kinds of collisions. And so when we're only looking at the universe and the visible and other wave uh, lengths of light, we have no real way of seeing this. Um, and so that's where gravitational waves come in. We can look for the gravitational radiation that these things are emitting and try to detect them. And it turns out that not only does the universe do this, it actually does it surprisingly often. And there's about one binary black hole merger every 15 minutes. So right now, there's tons of gravitational waves passing through all of you, but they're so tiny that it took us a very long time to be able to actually detect them. So the effects of these gravitational waves is shown in this animation here. So you can think of these uh, dots as freely floating particles, so maybe asteroids in the asteroid belt. And as a gravitational wave passes through the projector screen, this is the effect that would have on those freely floating particles. And what's actually happening here, those dots aren't getting moved physically. The space in between them is getting stretched and squeezed as a gravitational wave passes through. Um, now, it turns out that this animation is greatly exaggerated. If matter was getting distorted, uh, in the distances were getting distorted this much by gravitational waves, we'd all be ripped apart on a regular basis. Um, this is actually what we say one part in 10 to the 21. So uh, this many zeros before a one is how accurately we need to start measuring distances to be able to detect the distortions in space-time caused by gravitational waves. To put that into perspective, that's like measuring the distance to Alpha Centauri, uh, the nearest star to the sun, which is about four light years away, to the precision of the width of a human hair. So it's pretty hard. That's why it took us a little while to be able to do it. Um, but we were finally able to do that. And so we do that with a technique called interferometry. These are our telescopes. They don't look very conventional. We're not pointing pieces of glass at the sky. We're more, in effect, building very, very sensitive microphones. And they happen to look like L's. So very sensitive microphone look like L's. Um, we have two detectors that make up LIGO, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. We have one in Hanford, Washington, which is a short five hour or so drive away. We have another in Livingston, Louisiana. And we collaborate with a third detector called Virgo that's near Pisa, Italy. And so together, we built these detectors. They turned on in the 1990s. And we kind of slowly uh, turned up their sensitivity until eventually we got to the point of being able to make a detection. And so this is GW150914. So to break that down, GW stands for gravitational wave. 150914 stands for September 14th, 2015. And so 
these vibrations uh, of the detectors, are, the stretching and squeezing of space time is conveniently at frequencies that if I turn it to sound, we can pick up with the human ear. And so now what I'm gonna play for you is the data collected by the LIGO observatories, converted into sound that we can listen to, and what you're going to hear is the background noise of the detectors plus the sound of two 30 solar mass black holes colliding. So it's a little bit hard to hear, but there's these chirps in there. So uh, Ben Hamin kind of took my thunder a little bit with the chirp sound. Uh, but the, that chirping is the sound of those last five or so orbits of two 30 solar mass black holes orbiting one another until they collided and formed one final bigger black hole. Uh, so this was the very first time that we ever detected anything in gravitational waves. It was pretty exciting. It was very loud. So here I'm showing the actual data collected by the instruments with some slight modifications. We basically just distort the, the, the strength of each of the frequencies to kind of flatten out the noise floor to make all noise at all frequencies about the same. And then you get this kind of spectrogram. So this is showing the frequency on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. And this chirping here is just showing you you sweep up through the frequencies as these two black holes spiral into one another and collide. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, this is what the, the event looks like in the gravitational wave detectors. So we pick up this little bit of a chirp waveform here um, from 1509.14. And you'll notice this, this time axis here. So this is within a fraction of a second, uh, this gravitational wave lasted in the interferometers. Okay, so that was pretty exciting. That got a Nobel Prize, that's pretty cool. Um, so we keep the detectors running. We, we have an observatory after all. We wanna do lots of observations. We detected a second event that we lovingly call LVT 151012. So LVT stands for LIGO Virgo Trigger, and we basically wussed out and didn't call it a real gravitational wave signal because it wasn't quite loud enough for us to be totally confident in it. But okay, that's another uh, binary black hole system. So that's about a 19 solar mass black hole colliding into another 19 solar mass black hole. Uh, all right, we keep observing, and we have GW151226. So this uh, created a very eventful holiday season in 2015. We had our third detection. And this is the longest one so far. So this almost spent two seconds in the detector. And so what that means is it's actually lower mass. Um, the lower the mass of the binary black hole merger, or the lower mass of the, the merger in general, the longer the waveform spends in the detectors. And so this one was almost about two seconds long. And so that was a roughly 11 solar mass black hole colliding into a 11 solar mass black hole. Okay, so that was the end of our first observing run. We turned the detectors off. We did some tweaking, made them more sensitive. And then we turned back on and now we get to 2017. Okay, so this is um, our third confident detection, our fourth probable detection. Uh, another binary black hole merger. Okay, keep operating. Okay, another binary black hole merger. This one's kind of cool, it's getting long, but you know, binary black hole mergers are getting kind of boring. Um, <laughs> keep operating. All right, okay, great, another binary black hole detection. Um, okay, now we get here. So mid-August of last year, um, we detect this thing that we call GW170817. And so now this is pretty cool. This is going to like three seconds here. Uh, so that's the longest one in band so far. So that means it's probably the lowest mass. But how long did it actually spend in the detectors? Let's lengthen out that time axis. All right. Yeah, this is looking, this is looking better. All right, there we go. So it spent about a minute in our detectors. And so what that means is that had a mass of about 1.4 solar masses uh, of a, one object colliding into a 1.4 solar mass other object. And so this is square in the mass range that we expect for not black holes, but neutron stars, basically stellar sized atomic nuclei made up of mostly neutrons. A teaspoon of this stuff is about the mass of Mount Everest colliding into each other. Um, so this was really exciting. And what's also exciting is that this is the first time we expected matter to be around. And so this is the first time that we actually expect light to accompany the sound that we've been picking up so far. And so we were lucky enough that, first of all, this was already detected in the electromagnetic spectrum. A, a satellite, a Fermi gamma ray satellite, picked up an event that happened in the gamma rays within two seconds of the merger that LIGO detected. So this is exciting. This is what we call multi-messenger astronomy. This is what we've been uh, touting around as being one of the most exciting pieces of science that LIGO is going to be able to do, and we can do it now. So it's an incredibly exciting time. But from the gamma rays and from LIGO, we don't get a great pinpoint of where on the sky this event happens, so it's hard to follow up with other telescopes looking at other wavelengths of light. So here I'm now showing the night sky. 
Um, and I'm showing in green is where LIGO is able to constrain the location of the event to. And in dark blue is showing where the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope can constrain the location of the event to. But this area for astronomers is actually pretty big. And so only a few telescopes in the world are able to cover that kind of area quickly and try to find a counterpart. Um, but luckily, they were successful. So up here is showing the swope image of GW170817. So this is the host galaxy, NGC4993, that the event is in. And down here is showing an archival image that was taken 20 days before the event actually happened. And you can see there's no bright dot there. So that's where our confidence, at least in early times, came from. We were actually detecting some new transient thing that didn't exist there in the past. So this is really exciting. Now we had a precise location, and we can let loose all of our telescopes on it. So we observed for um, many, many days. We're actually still observing. This is showing the observations that I was a part of the team of um, that we took with DECAM in Chile. And so this is the event at half a day after the event happened. And now I'm going to play you a few days' worth of data that we've collected. And you can see how this thing is slowly fading away in optical light. All right. We're running out of time. All right, so not only did we de detect things with DECAM, we detected things with about 80 different observatories around the ground and in space and across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We detected it in gamma rays, X-rays, UV, optical IR, radio. It's still glowing in X-ray. It's still glowing in radio. So our observations continue. This is what happened. We made gold. It's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> Give that, give that mic a person. Yep. Our fifth contestant, everybody, hold on. We're rolling through the physics here tonight. Our next contestant is going to be Dr. Tristan Urso, who's got his PhD in, at Caltech in Pasadena, California. And uh, Tristan got here to UO in fall of 2014. And his general area of study is biophysics of collective behavior. Interesting title. I think that a one sentence description of his talk is throughout nature, when many simple animals come together, complex and sometimes even intelligent behavior emerges. Let's explore how and why this happens. Ladies and gentlemen, Tristan. Thank you, and seen a group of animals behaving in a way that is radically different from how individual animals in that group would normally behave. Of course, it's got turned off. There we go. That was sabotage on Ben Hamin's part. <laughs> All right. So consider a bird, a single bird. It's got its little bird brain in there. And yet, you put a few hundred, maybe even a few thousand of these birds together, and all of a sudden, they start to do some pretty amazing things, things that look choreographed, like there's a leader. It looks physical in a certain sense, like a bigger object with more coarse properties to it. Incidentally, if all of you drive down to the dump south of Eugene, you will find birds doing this on certain evenings. And it's not unlike, entirely, synchronized swimming. Did you know that's a, I just learned this is an Olympic sport. I did not know that. So. <laughs> And in general, you see this phenomena all across nature. We see it when fish come together. They school and they form. How do they know how to make a sphere, right? How do they, is somebody guiding that? No. Then we have ants. We have people that do this. And it goes all the way down to single cells, to bacteria that will do it as well. We call this phenomena collective behavior. What that means is that the way the group behaves is somehow fundamentally and measurably different from how individuals behave. So let's think about how this actually happens, how the transition from little individual behaviors to some sort of big collective behavior occurs. So hopefully some of you have seen this video. If you have not, it's great. These are six Scotty puppies. <laughs> they're, they're drinking milk out of a dish. And of course, what they're doing is you see them rotating. That is probably the simplest example of a collective behavior, right? And it took. The key thing here is that it took all six to do it. Because if I was to make a plot of how fast <laughs> they go around the dish versus how many puppies there are, the rotation rate would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And all of a sudden, when it gets to six puppies, they begin to go around the dish. 
right? So all of a sudden, some new behavior pops out of the system. We see this in lots of other systems, too. You see it in herds of animals. This thing, I want you to put yourself in the perspective of a sheep in this situation. All you can see around you at the level of like a sheep is just a few other sheep right around you, right? That's all you can see. Yet somehow, on the very large scale of thousands of sheep that are in this, this video, they all seem to know where they're going, where to point, and you wonder, is there a leader? Well, I'm here to tell you there definitely is not a leader, and that what's happening here is clearly being governed by whatever the local interactions are between any particular sheep and the other sheep in that group, right? The other important thing to realize is that somehow, with the puppies, with the fish, with the birds, with the bacteria, with the sheep, the details aren't that important, right? Because all of these sheep have like different amounts of fur, they might weigh a little bit different, they might run a at different speeds, but somehow all of those details kind of get washed out and they still exhibit this collective behavior when they come together. So, it's, this collective behavior is about more than just movement though. I've shown you all examples of movement thus far, but now I want to take you into a more interesting realm. Consider the lowly ant. You've all stepped on one, probably today. <laughs> this is the most numerous insect, and by that virtue, maybe even, you know, animal on the planet, depending on how you count. No single ant within a colony has any idea, even the word idea doesn't make sense in this context, any idea what it's doing any more than a human knows what's going on throughout an entire city as they're walking around. And much like the sheep and other examples, these humans in this picture only know what's going on locally around them. They don't know what's going on 17 blocks away. So something interesting begins to happen. When you put thousands of ants together, depending on the species, it can up to be up to millions of ants, some interesting things occur. So in a lab in the volcanology building here, my collaborators and I have been trying to understand how ants begin to do things, how, how structure and order emerge. So what I have here on the left, you've got the entry from the nest. On the right, you've got food, which happen to be leaves in this case. And you can watch this video. These little specks are the ants moving in a time-lapse video. You can watch as they begin to explore. Of course, the video stopped. Uh, they begin to explore, they make an initial trail, and the trail condenses into a new trail. How did they know what was the shortest trail? How did they figure out where the food was? How did they optimize this path and actually do this? Well, I'm gonna try to give you an idea of how that happens. Of course, on another scale, when you really get millions of ants together, they build incredible things, and I, I cannot stress enough how mind-blowing this is. That is an ant city. It has roads, it has kitchens, and auditoriums where ants gather, where things are grown. It has purpose. Yet, there is no single ant that has any idea what is going on inside that, that colony. And I also want to point out that there's something familiar about this. Does anybody see it? Kind of looks, looks like a city from space. And it turns out that cities before urban planning was a thing grew organically, and they look a heck of a lot like ant colonies. So let's think about this. The simple individuals like humans or ants at a large scale can start to build very complex things that seem designed. But if we take what I said as true, which it is, if there's no leader, <laughs> if there's no architect or designer to what's happening here, if no individual has any idea what the group is actually doing, how is it that structure and order emerge in these systems? So it turns out that the origin of order in these systems is through things called rule sets, which just means if X, then Y. If I do something, I encounter some condition, I have to, a certain response to that condition. And in the case of the ants, let's use them as a case study, any particular ant might be walking along and it's executing this kind of biological computer program. It walks along and it lays down a scent, which happens to be called a pheromone. It lays down this scent, which is this little orange line here. Another ant comes along, smells that scent, it's like, oh, this, this looks good, let's go this way. So it lays down, it, it also walks down that path and strengthens that scent, right? So the signal actually gets stronger where two ants have gone. But then you have a problem, so to speak. When an ant encounters a fork in the road, it has to make a decision about where to go. And that's where the interesting stuff happens is when they have to make decisions because that's the point when the little biological computer program sets in. Oh, if I encounter this, then what should I do? If I encounter two paths, one's stronger, one's weaker, what do I actually do? That those questions I just posed to you are basically like little knobs in this system. They're like, oh, what do I mean by knobs? I mean, they're kind of questions. These are actually quantitative in a sense when we actually do the simulations. But how long does the scent last for? How fast does the scent spread? How many ants are there? Because that's gonna affect how often the pheromone, the scent, gets laid down. 
What's the sharpest angle? In other words, how can the ants actually move over the surface? And for instance, how often do they make mistakes if they encounter a fork and they're thinking, I want to go down the one that smells best, but then they might just make an error occasionally, right? So we have these knobs and we can simulate, we can give a particular rule set and ask, well, what kind of path structure does that build? If we institute this particular rule set and then let it play out, it's going to build something on the collective behavior level. So we make little changes to the rule sets and we watch how the collective behavior, the path of the ants, actually changes. So here's what these things actually look like. I'm going to show you a number of different simulations. Some of these paths, so in some of these movies, you'll see these little orange dots in a square. That's basically entrances to a fictitious nest. The ants automatically wire up these things together in this pattern you see here. In this case, it's rather dynamic. No one's telling them how to do this. This is the result of the rule set that we put into the simulation. In other cases, those rule sets lead to, yeah, they make paths, but the paths aren't very stable. They don't really connect up quite right. So this would be maybe you can consider a non-functional rule set. In other cases, they cover space too well. They might make something that looks kind of like Swiss cheese. So there's so many ants and so much pheromones getting laid down that it makes this sort of useless but very well covering network. In other cases, it makes things that look like meandering rivers. And in fact, when you actually look at the structure of the things that they build from this rule set, this is a particular rule set, it actually starts to look like what meandering rivers look like and, guess what, what ant trails actually look like in nature. We also, oops, sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have the little thing. There we go. We also have cases where they build highly branched networks, things that just cover space and change all the time, that are very reminiscent of things like neurons or lightning. And it turns out there's a deep physical reason why all these things look similar to other phenomena in nature. Sadly, in my time, I won't be able to get there, but you can ask me later. We have cases where the rule set produces behavior that actually looks like fluids, like the ants get corralled and those corrals join together. And it doesn't even make a path network, it just makes this thing that looks kind of fluid-like, reminiscent of, for instance, oil and water. And believe it or not, you actually see this in ant colonies. They'll do this thing called a death spiral, which is this group of ants that sort of look fluid-like. We have other cases that we haven't really, there's not really a good name for them, but they're highly dynamic, they explore space, they can wire things together, like this one. They're kind of fun to watch, by the way. And one of my favorite ones is this one, because you watch this play out, it's highly dynamic, and again, at least to my eye, and, and there are ways of actually measuring this, you look at this pattern that's getting traced out over time, and it looks a heck of a lot like road networks that you see from space in human cities. So with that, these systems are solving a problem. In this particular case, they're solving the problem of how to get from A to B efficiently. And so this set of rules is actually solving a problem. And it happens to be something that was selected for in ants. So as the number of individuals grows, whether we're talking about ants, humans, maybe even neurons in your head, and as these rule sets get very complex, does this become intelligence? If I'm solving a problem well, that in many cases is called intelligence. So who are you? Well, I'm going to put forth a slightly provocative notion that you are actually the collective behavior of about 100 billion neurons in your head executing a particularly complicated rule set. And so with that, I'll leave you with one last thought. There is this deep connection, intangible connection, through rule sets between you and all of these other collective behavior systems. You are all huge assemblages of rule sets playing out, leading to some new emergent behavior. You're welcome. Take our 100 billion collective selves here for a moment. <laughs> our last contestant of the evening is Jason Paulos. Jason is going to be represented soft, condensed matter physics. And a one sentence summary is I'll talk about how the humble pizza and the lowly donut bring us closer to deep mathematical truths and Nobel Prize winning physics insights. Pizza, let's do it. Jason, thank you. when you're ready, sir. Uh, all right, how's that good? All right, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I realize I'm, I'm standing between you and the door, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, so 
I work in a field of what's called condensed matter theory, which is a fancy way of saying I think about stuff. Um, condensed matter theory is a vast branch of physics, um, and you know, these are just a few of many, many, many examples of questions that we ask, uh, all having to do with uh, how materials behave and what the mathematical models might be that underpin how materials behave. So today I just thought I would like to give you uh, a little taste of the kind of things we do um, by uh, going through two examples that, that, that have something to do with food. Because, you know, we all like food, we all need it. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by thinking about uh, a humble slice of pizza. I don't have a slice of pizza here, so this is my slice of pizza. It's a piece of paper. Um, but uh, what I want to do is demonstrate a problem that probably all of you have, um, have encountered, which is you see a slice of pizza hot off the oven, thin crust, you know, it's, it's waiting there, waiting for you to eat it, and you pick it up, and it droops, and all of the toppings fall on your foot, and that's just no fun, and so you say, okay, I gotta start again. Um, but it turns out, you know, uh, if anyone here has eaten more than one slice of pizza in their lives, you know, you know, you know there's a solution to this, you know, you've, you've worked it out. Uh, so what you do is, instead of picking the pizza up like this, you, you hold it so that you give it a little fold, yes, at the very end, and that gives you a nice slice of pizza, structurally solid, topping stays on, you can aim it at your mouth, everyone's happy, <laughs> great slice of pizza. So, that's, you know, I'm glad we can all do that, but what's, what's going on? What's, uh, what's, why can we do this? It turns out there's some deep mathematics associated with it. Um, and so there, there are actually two things going on. One of them is that um, a slice of pizza, which you know, ideally is like a sheet of paper. This is like, you know, this is, this is how all pizza should be. But anyway, paper, as we know, is very thin. And one of the properties of things that are thin is that they can bend very easily. But it's very hard to stretch them. It's actually really hard to stretch paper. You could tear it. But short of tearing it, the only thing you can do is bend it. So that's, that's a fact about thin sheets, thin materials. But now there's a cool mathematical fact, uh, what's, uh, what's been named a remarkable theorem. It was actually called that by, uh, by the mathematician who proved it back in the 19th century. Um, and what that theorem says is if you have a sheet of uh, something like paper, something very thin, which can only bend, and it can, but it cannot stretch, if it starts out flat, it has to remain flat in at least one direction at all times. So whatever bends you're making, you know, whether you roll it into a tube, there's that nice straight line of the cylinder there. You try to warp it in any way, but there's always one straight line you can draw through every point. That's a guarantee. It's a mathematical requirement. And what that means is if you now put in that fold into your slice of pizza, you're imposing curvature in one direction which means it's guaranteed to remain flat in the perpendicular direction. And that's what's giving your pizza, your slice of pizza, its rigidity. That's what's keeping it from falling on the ground. So curvature um, equals strength. And this is not only responsible for us being able to eat pizza, but also is responsible for us uh, being able to take our pizza out of the store in a pizza box, because pizza boxes are made of paper. And paper, you would think, isn't all that strong, except pizza boxes are actually corrugated sheets of paper, which means that they have these ridges in them. And each ridge is bring, giving you one of these folds, which means that there is a perpendicular direction which remains straight at all times. And that's the direction that's stiff when you pick up your piece of cardboard. So, so thanks to, essentially, geometry, thanks to how these sheets, these shapes behave um, in nature, we can we can have our pizza and eat it too. <laughs> so this is an example where um, we have some mathematical rules. We have geometry. And we have, as a result, something about something we can understand about the physical world, uh, some material property. In this case, the structural integrity of your pizza slice. Um, so uh, I'd like to give you another example of this. Um, dealing with a different branch of mathematics. This is a cousin of geometry called topology. 
And in the material property we're talking about is, um, is not, uh, it's not the structural rigidity, but actually something about how electrons flow in a very particular kind of structure. But let's start by um, asking what's topology. So we're relatively familiar with geometry. You know, it's you know, all lines and angles and, and things like that. But, um, but to give you a sense of what uh, topology is, of what a topological measurement might be, um, um, I just uh, uh, imagine the following thought experiment. We can all, we can all go through this um, together. Um, which is, uh, one day your friend came by and she left you this device, this meter, and she said, oh, it's, it's really great, you should try it, and then she ran away. <laughs> but she didn't tell you what it measures. You have no idea, so you know, it, has some, it has some leads, it has, a, it has an arrow, you know, it's, there, there's some numbers on there, uh, you know, but you have no idea what it, what it might be doing. So in this case, what do you do? Maybe it measures weight, maybe it measures length, maybe it measures how hot things are. Uh, so maybe, yeah, uh, if you're like me, just think, okay, well, I'll just try it out. And if you're like me, you have in your office, lying around, a lot of donuts, because everyone <laughs> likes donuts. So you uh, take this donut and stick it into your meter, <laughs> and you see what happens. And what ends up happening is, I hope you caught that, that was, that was, that was very fast, let's do it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is, uh, the meter points at the number one. Say, okay, one, hmm. Well, maybe, maybe this meter is in uh, measuring weight in quarters of a pound, and so this is an exactly one quarter pound donut, so it says one, maybe. So let's try, let's try a different donut. So the next day you bring your donut of the day, your choice of the day. Uh, it's a little mushy, it's got some sugar on it. It's probably a different weight, different surface area from the donut from yesterday, and you plug it in, and it goes back to one. And you think, hmm, that's weird. A lot of, this, a lot of things about this donut are very different from the last donut, uh, but it gives you the same answer. And so the next day you try a cronut. Okay, you know, maybe if I try something fancy, um, <laughs> let's see what happens. Uh, put it in. Yeah, still one. Um, you know, it could, it could have been 0.27, it could have been 3.88, but keep giving you the answer one. Uh, the next day you think, okay, well, I just really want a Boston cream donut. I mean, I just really want a Boston cream donut, so I'm gonna get one, and I'm gonna stick it in, and it stays at zero. And you think, hmm, that's interesting. And then that starts giving you a hint for what this meter might be doing. And just to test it out, the next day you bring in a pretzel, and you stick it in. Oh, interesting. So what this meter was doing, is telling you how many holes, or how many math what mathematicians like to call handles, places where you can go in and grip the shape. Uh, and you know, that, that's what this meter is doing. This is an example of a topological quantity because it is something that has to be an integer. You can only have one hole or no holes or three. You can't have 2.76. Um, and you can have a whole class of different, different donuts that all give you exactly the same answer. It doesn't matter that they're made from slightly different things, that were made on different days, they've been sitting in your office for a week, they still give you the number one. It's a robust measurement of something that's guaranteed to give you that value. So, you know, this all is nice, but we all knew that, you know, donuts have one hole. I mean, hopefully that's not what, you know, UFO is gonna pay me to do next year, right? <laughs> but it turns out that in physics, there are um, examples of quantities which you might not suspect would have an integer answer, but they do because underlying those quantities is some mathematical structure that has holes or handles in it. And the classic example of this, this was a theoretical understanding of an experimental mystery of what's called the quantum Hall effect. I won't tell you the details of what, how you measure it, but if you stick a certain kind of sample in a magnetic field and measure a resistance um, at very low temperatures and at very high magnetic fields, it turns out when you change the magnetic field strength, you would have expected resistance could be any number, really. But it's, if you actually go in and measure it, it takes these, this very step-like features uh, in your measurement, which means your magnetic field, your, your resistance, actually can't take just any value. It takes a very particular form of value. It's this number in ohms divided by n, 
where n is an integer, and that integer is actually a topological index, something like the number of holes in the underlying quantum mechanical structure of the electrons. Now, um, that was all well and good. This is all I wanted to tell you, except, of course, I was, I was promising you something about food, and there's nothing on here. Well, well, there is something on here in that this theoretical understanding um, was uh, uh, part of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2016, given to uh, David J. Thales, who's uh, up, uh, up at the University of Washington. And of course, he only got half the prize. He had to share it with someone else, um, which, which means that you know, he only got to eat half of the chocolate that was in the Nobel Prize medal. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, there are the six contestants tonight. Well, as you heard, six tales, different facets of physics. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a couple minutes to compile the votes. If you recall, we have 200 folks in the, in the audience tonight, and each of them have a, an electronic vote. And um, so here's what I'm going to do. Oh, let's see. Some, yeah, maybe the mic a little bit. There we go. So one thing we'd like to do is um, I'm going to put them on the spot real quick and have everybody stand up. Tim, if you'd stand up real quick, if you'd say that Tim Cohen was our first contestant. <laughs> you want to say, you have one, uh, 50, 30 seconds to, to, to summarize. Here, come on back here. Everybody, everybody gets one, one, one statement to make about their talk. I guess I would say, this mic is awful. Um, so if you, uh, if you thought that the solar system was empty, then um, I would uh, encourage you to stare at your hand for a while and, and think about the fact that there is more space between the protons and the electrons there than there is between the sun and Neptune. Well done, sir. Thank you, Jim. So for our judges, we are now opening up the voting for Dr. Cohen. Please submit your votes now. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. A is one. A is one. A is one. Sorry. Yep. A is one. Up through five. Okay. Hold on. One is the best score. Okay. And a, yeah. <laughs> a is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, E is five, and A is the best. So rank Tim's presentation on a score from one to five where one is the best. Using the criteria that are, on, that are shown up here. No peak in Tristan. So click in now, you got 15 seconds. The votes are coming in. Thank you, folks. Oh. Oh, oh, one second, one second. Is 
So our second speaker, Laura. Do you remember Laura? Everybody, thank you very much. Laura, can you come up and, and give us just a one sentence, a one sentence summary if you'd like to. Okay, uh, I don't know how you can get any more super than super symmetry. <laughs> nicely said, nicely said. So judges, please um, enter your votes for Laura right now. We'll keep the voting open in 30 seconds. The folks upstairs can't see, but our judges are doing all sorts of gymnastics to hold the transceivers to the point where they can actually uh, get their votes in. So it's, it, we, it's, going, it's going good. Thank, thank you very much. Give us a moment. We'll tabulate. Our third contestant, Benjamin Alaman. Would you like to come up, sir? Who wants an earball in their phone? <laughs> Woo! Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Voting is open. Thank you very much. Voting is closed. Tabulation starting. Our fourth contestant tonight, Dr. Ben Farr. All right, uh, I'll steal a page out of Tim's book and say, look at your hand. And uh, if you happen to be wearing some gold jewelry, chances are that that was formed in a binary neutron star collision. And that's only one of very, very many things that we're gonna learn with this new window to the universe. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Voting is open. Thank you very much. We're tabulating. Our fourth contestant, Tristan, or the, our fifth contestant, Tristan Ursell. Thank you. Just remember. Collective behavior is all around you and in you. Well, very well said. We're very prophetic folks we have tonight. Folks, voting is open. Thank you very much. We got them. And our last speaker, last but not least, we have Jason. Um, all I have to say is, if pizza and donuts can't win over an audience, I don't know what can. Thank, thank you very much. Voting is open, folks. Thank you very much, and if you give us a moment, we're going to get our mathematics on here.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner tonight. An extraordinary close call between first and second, small little gap to third, and a very, very close call between the rest of the spots. I'd just like to note that there was a one new rule installed since the last physics slam, and that is the winner of the previous slam gets the honor of being the MC for the next one. So allow me to say that the, as I pass my virtual crown to the next winner, congratulations to everybody. Thank you very much for putting on a good event tonight. And thanks to everybody here for showing up. 500 people came to see physicists talk tonight. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce the winner of tonight's Physics Slam, 2018 champion, Tristan Ursell. Along with the virtual crown, Tristan has also got a University of Oregon growler that I'm sure the gentleman will put to good use. <laughs> and there's a gift card in there for a beverage of his choice. <laughs> so, so, so again, let's give Tristan one quick round of applause and then we got one last thing to do. I'd like to officially turn you all loose. Thank you all for coming. And we would are going to invite all of our speakers to come up and hold a little Q&A. So let's give everybody a couple minutes to get settled. And let's talk physics for a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.